To many of the most powerful nations throughout history, the idea of war has appeared unpalatable, uncivilized, or simply just inconvenient. Major nations, big global players, have disagreements all the time over trade or borders or ideology, some of which are too important or too irreconcilable to fix over the negotiating table. But if every failed negotiation led to the world's best fighting forces taking up arms, well... The world order would never know peace. But there's a hell of a lot of grey space between polite conversation and all-out war. And if you're going to be operating in that grey space, then it helps to have some friends who can go to war for you. From brief skirmishes between virtually unknown tribes to decades-long wars that claim the lives of millions, countless conflicts across history have attempted to squash the beef between major powers while ensuring that those major powers weren't the ones getting their hands dirty. In today's installment of our Art of War series, we're going to dig into the theory and practice of proxy warfare, why it happens, how it works, and some of the many, many times the proxy conflicts have rewritten history. At its most basic level, a proxy war is a contrast to a traditional war. A war in which Nation A and Nation B are mad at each other, so Nations A and B gather up their respective militaries and go and have a bit of a fight. A proxy war, then, is a war in which Nations A and B don't go head to head, but instead lean on a third party to do the fighting for them. Those third parties could be allied nations, formal or informal protectorates, non-state groups, insurgencies, or even civilian protesters. But in general, a proxy conflict will take one of three basic forms. If we imagine that Nation A's smaller subsidiary ally is Nation A1 and Nation B's ally is Nation B1, then we might see Nation A fighting Nation B1 or Nation A1 fighting Nation B or Nation A1 fighting Nation B1. The whole point is that Nation A and Nation B never meet directly in open conflict. Now, that's not to say that either Nation A or Nation B would ignore a proxy conflict. Far from it. Instead, these major powers partner together with the minor powers. The minor power is the one sending troops into battle, but the major power could be providing anything from financial support to weapons to training to safe haven, or in some cases, taking away their own troops' uniforms and sending them out in battle to help out. Are you ready for heart-pounding, adrenaline-pumping action in a game that takes vehicle combat to a whole new level? Well, look no further than War Thunder, the most most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. Join War Thunder and embark on epic journeys with more than 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters and ships battling it out in dynamic combined arms PvP battles. Every vehicle is a bit of a masterpiece, meticulously modeled down to their individual components, creating an incredibly immersive combat experience. War Thunder's collection spans over a hundred years of development, offering intense PvP battles with various immersion levels for all playstyles. And the best part, you can customize your vehicle with hundreds of camouflages, historical markings, and 3D decorators, making each machine truly unique. Immerse yourself in stunning 4K resolution graphics, authentic sound effects, and a captivating soundtrack that brings the battlefield to life. Say goodbye to general hit points, War Thunder's realistic damage system shows exactly what happens to your vehicle when it's hit. And don't worry about complex controls, War Thunder's intuitive mouse aim mode lets you dominate the skies with just your mouse and keyboard. What I love most about War Thunder is the way it seamlessly combines air, ground, and naval combat. It's a bit of an adrenaline rush, and I think you'll love it too. The fire, smoke effects are incredible, the vehicle details, the immersive soundscape, it all comes together to create an amazing game. So what are you waiting for? Play War Thunder for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox using the link below. And if you register using that link, you'll not only get to play War Thunder for free, but you'll also receive a massive bonus pack with premium vehicles, a premium account, boosters, and much more. So what are you waiting for? Join the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. Play War Thunder for free through the link below. Dominate the battlefield. Thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. And now back to it. This way, the major powers involved in proxy conflicts do end up spending their resources on a war, and both sides will typically give their all to attain victory, but neither of the major powers should ever be able to hold each other directly responsible for the damage that the war brings. It's not a secret that both major powers are involved, at least not usually, but that isn't the point. The point is that neither of the major powers actually wants to bear the costs of going to war with each other, but both sides are able to stomach the significant but lesser damage of a bit of a side conflict. 
conflict. Now, there's a few key reasons why major powers would generally elect to pursue a proxy war. Perhaps the most obvious is that the nation would rather not send its own citizens off to die if it doesn't have to. At other times, it's a matter of cost, where waging a major war would be prohibitively expensive, especially for countries that can't foot the bill of moving troops between regions or even continents at scale. Or, in the case of the largest proxy conflict in history, the Cold War, the two major powers involved could do some truly unacceptable levels of damage to each other if they ever met in direct conflict. As we'll discuss at length, just about any cost is worth avoiding a full-on world-ending nuclear exchange, a consensus that the US and the Soviet Union thankfully agreed upon. Proxy warfare gives each side just enough plausible deniability that such a potentially devastating outcome can be avoided. In other cases, proxy warfare offers real advantages that major powers often can't get. For example, if you'd like to bring down some third world dictator in a remote difficult area to navigate, it's far more likely that a knowledgeable local insurgency can have success rather than a group of your own special operators. And finally, there's the matter of solidarity. Be it a question of politics, religion, shared ethnicity, or anything else, a major power can advance its own goals or ideologies by helping its smaller foreign partners advance themselves. The other side of that coin, though, is that if the major power we're discussing has an equally powerful army, then that enemy is going to want to make sure they don't get their way. We've seen long-term proxy wars play out like this to pit communism against capitalism, Shia versus Sunni Islam, Catholicism against Protestantism, and, well, a whole lot more. So, with a clear view of when and why proxy warfare takes place, it's only right that we should now discuss the how, the tried and true methods that pop up again and again when proxy wars are being carried out. Unlike an alliance between two nations who simply want to fight a war alongside each other, proxy wars are strictly hierarchical. The minor powers involved probably wouldn't be fighting at all, or might even not stand a chance, except that it's acting on the will of its larger ally. Depending on which party you ask, this relationship might be described as benevolent or transactional or exploitative. Really, it depends, but typically it's a short-term and highly conditional partnership. Do what the big boss says and you'll be rewarded. Go off script or fail to keep up and the big boss will find someone else worth their time. The major powers support can manifest in a number of different ways. In some cases, they'll train a smaller nation or an insurgency's troops or physically provide heavy-duty weapons and equipment that they wouldn't otherwise have had. At other times, they might supply crucial intelligence or tactical support in planning and carrying out attacks. They might provide large sums of money and let the smaller partner figure out the rest themselves. Or they might handpick some of their own elite soldiers and tell those soldiers to go and help out the smaller nation as mercenaries. It's not uncommon to see a major power offer logistical support or organize recruitment drives or help out with creating propaganda or organize other recruitment drives where fighters from around the world are convinced to travel on their own and go and help out. As for how success is defined, there are a range of options. The proxy war can be won outright, or the smaller nation might grow powerful enough to carry on the fight without help, or the situation can settle into a stalemate or a balance that everyone could just learn to live with. And lastly, we should also lay out just how risky proxy warfare is as a method of engagement. Although entire global conflicts have been decided by proxy battles in the past, those same attempts at proxy warfare have just as often deteriorated into direct major power confrontation or otherwise gone way off course from what was supposed to be happening. Just as an example, leaning on a smaller power or a non-state actor requires that actor to be trustworthy. And often those allies aren't quite as trustworthy as a major power might think. Just take the Afghan Mujahideen, who used US-supplied armaments to fight the Soviets in the 1980s, but turned them back against the Americans just a few years later. At other times, proxy forces might not show up to battle in nearly the numbers that their sponsor had hoped, or they might become overly reckless, willing to take risks or make tactical errors because they know that their sponsors can get them out of a bad situation. And finally, proxy conflict has a nasty tendency to create situations where the end justifies the means. Take, for example, a major power that trusts a regional leader to shut down dissent or political opposition, but chooses to ignore the fact that this leader is torturing and disappearing their population in order to keep them in line. Proxy conflict is chosen almost invariably because it is the lesser of two evils. But being the lesser of two evils absolutely does not make something good. Although we've got a wealth of modern examples of proxy warfare, which we are absolutely going to get to in a moment, 
we'd be remiss to skip over some of the more ancient examples of the practice. For example, the Byzantine Empire were masters of proxy warfare, which ironically enough has been referred to as Byzantine politics in the past. Rather than attack any of their rivals themselves, the Byzantines had a nasty habit of stoking animosity between multiple rivals at once and then sitting back and sipping their tea nonchalantly while those rivals went to war with each other. Much like modern powers, the Byzantines would then toss a bit of money one way or the other, or enter as peacemakers once the conflict had gone on long enough. Across the continent in Western Europe, the French would use similar strategies to inflame the Wars of the Roses, fought between the warring English houses of York and Lancaster. The French king, Louis XI, saw fit to back York in the wars, while his main rival, the Duke of Burgundy, threw his lot in with Lancaster. Although the wars would throw England into chaos, it was largely on the back of foreign aid provided by France and the Low Countries, who oh, were the ultimate beneficiary of a weakened English crown. The 19th century provided a few significant examples of proxy warfare as an integral part of the broader wheeling and dealing between European powers. For example, in the Egyptian-Ottoman War, Egypt fought with the support of France and Spain, while the Ottoman Empire solicited aid from the British, the Austrians, the Prussians, and the Tsarist Russians in a war that eventually saw Muhammad Ali, not that Muhammad Ali, recognized as the ruler of Egypt. In Uruguay, Samoa, and Sudan, similar battles played out, although the events of the 1910s Ends, namely a global and very non-proxy world war, saw these sorts of conflicts placed on hold for a time. But World War I also brought about the fall of the Tsars in Russia, thus kicking off the first in a long series of proxy conflicts in which Soviet Russia supported communist movements around the world. That first conflict was the Finnish Civil War, in which the Finnish White Guard, backed by Germany, fought to preserve the nation's democratic practice against the Red Guards, a communist paramilitary faction that garnered strong support from the Soviets. After a hard-fought war that saw some 40,000-odd casualties in total, the Finnish White Army was able to overcome the Red Guards, even despite their back of Germany being defeated in World War I shortly after the conflict ended. In the following years, Turkey and Hungary would each have their reckonings with foreign intervention in their homegrown revolutions. But it is the Spanish Civil War that provided an exceptionally relevant proxy war, with the fascist regimes of Italy, Germany, and Portugal throwing their support behind the Spanish Nationalists, a rebel faction led by future fascist dictator Francisco Franco. On the other side, the Soviets attempted to support the Second Spanish Republic, with France briefly getting in on the action as well. On the one hand, the conflict was a valuable opportunity for each of these foreign powers to send soldiers to support on the ground. There they picked up experience which would inform their approach to World War II, especially in the case of Germany's Luftwaffe pilots. But far more importantly, Europe's unified fascist powers were able to put Franco in power, and though Franco ultimately declined to join Hitler and Mussolini in World War II, he also took Spain off the board as far as the Allied powers were concerned, making a Nazi victory in continental Europe far more achievable. Again, proxy wars took a backseat during World War II, but it didn't take long for them to begin again, even before the war had even finished up completely. In the Chinese Civil War, the US and the Soviet Union got their first chance to sit on opposite sides of the fence, as Soviet aid helped propel Mao Zedong's Chinese Communist Party to victory over Chiang Kai-shek's US-backed Chinese Nationalist Party. At the same time, the two sides would battle in the shadows over control of Iran. Paraguay, and British Malaya, while the US also had to deal with the combined influence of Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and Albania in their attempt to help a communist faction take over Greece. In these early years, the Americans and the Soviets would each take wins and losses in a series of conflicts that essentially set the table for what was to come. And the thing that came next was the Cold War, the decade-long struggle between the US and the Soviet Union, which both sides agreed that it was absolutely imperative that they didn't go directly to war with each other. After all, that would almost definitely precipitate the launch of a truly insane number of nuclear weapons, and both America and the Soviets had, well, slightly more chill than that. Instead, the Soviets and the Americans ended up on the opposite sides of the Korean War, the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya, the Vietnam War, the Congo Crisis, the Ethiopian Civil War, the Afghan Civil War, and a very, very long list of civil wars and uprisings in Latin America. That's not necessarily to say that the US and the Soviets were always on opposing sides, though. They had both supported Egypt in the Suez Crisis against the will of France, Israel, and the UK, and they had worked together to support the 1959 Tibetan uprising against communist China, although China eventually gained victory there. But by and large, the Cold War was made up almost exclusively of proxy conflicts between these two global superpowers. In some cases, like Vietnam and Korea, American troops ended up fighting on the battlefield directly, opposed not by the Soviets, but by Soviet-backed opposition movements. 
The same thing happened in reverse in Afghanistan. The Soviets weren't getting shot at by Americans, but they were getting shot at by American weapons in the hands of Afghan militants. But in most of the era's conflicts, both the US and the Soviet Union would throw their support behind opposing sides in civil wars or a border dispute or a recently inflamed but very old cultural or tribal disagreements. Those sorts of engagements were far lower impact, generally involving the loss of a lot fewer lives, but they were far greater in number than the instances where either American or Soviet troops were drawn into battle directly. Just as important were American and Soviet efforts to prop up various dictatorships and regional allies to ensure that certain parts of the world remained under their control. For example, the United States spent the 1970s and 80s orchestrating Operation Condor, a coordinated intelligence sharing effort that allowed authoritarian regimes across Latin America to hunt down dissidents on each other's soil. Likewise, the Soviet secret police spent decades hard at work trying to root out any American attempts to subvert their authority on Soviet soil. As such, the conflict between the Americans and the Soviets was largely decided by the results of their proxy wars, with the United States proving able to weather a war of economic attrition, while the Soviet Union ultimately collapsed under its own weight. But, alas, proxy warfare didn't end when the Cold War did. Instead, the sovereign state of Russia largely pivoted into the major power vacancies that the Soviet Union had left behind. In the 1990s, NATO and Russia ended up on opposing sides of the Georgian Civil War, and each side did quite a bit of puppetry behind the scenes to figure out where exactly each new post-Soviet state would align itself. During these years, Russia, Ukraine, and Greece also entered into a sort of proxy war with Turkey, Pakistan, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, who had chosen to put aside their differences and fight toward the breakup of Yugoslavia. Pakistan and Iran also ended up facing off against Russia during a civil war in Tajikistan, while the US and France ended up being major players in major conflicts in Congo, Nepal, and on the Ivory Coast. Rounding off our historical examples, the first Libyan civil war in 2011 was practically the proxy war to end all proxy wars, as a massive US-led global coalition sought to support the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi, and a smaller, more ragtag coalition of mostly leftist states worked unsuccessfully to keep the mad dictator in power. In the modern era, though, no proxy war has played out quite so visibly as the Syrian civil war, a multidimensional and quickly evolving conflict that is almost unrecognizable in 2023 from what it had been in the early 2010s. From the start of the conflict, many countries around the world had at least some skin in the game. The regime of Bashar al-Assad was seen as a stabilizing influence in the region, as well as an economic partner and geopolitical ally for countries like Russia, Iran, and China, while Western powers like the US, the UK, and the European Union had hoped that Syria would become yet another victory for the Arab Spring movement. But since then, the innumerable Syrian factions on the ground and the military contributions of foreign nations have turned the Syrian civil war into a conflict that, at times, has seemed to only nominally be about deciding the fate of Syria. Instead, it's been a forum for US-backed militias to clash with Russian-backed ones, for Israel and Iran to do much of the same, for Turkey to force the world to take sides in its long-running conflict with the Middle East's Kurdish population, and for disputes between secularist and Islamist governing principles to be settled with blood. The rise of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria has just muddied the waters further, as the many, many proxy wars going on in Syria had also to take place against the backdrop of a very real, very direct war against the Islamic State. Overall, the civil war has appeared to resolve mostly in Russia's favor, with the Assad regime seeming to be on the precipice of victory at the time that the script for this video was written. But this has been at the cost of millions of dollars per day for Russia, and on the occasions when Russian forces have clashed directly with the Syrian militias that opposed them, those battles have resulted in thousands of dead Syrian civilians, including, by some estimates, nearly 2,000 children who were directly killed by Russian forces. Many of the Russian troops who gained experience in Syria now fighting Ukraine, either for the Russian military itself or for the paramilitary Wagner Group. Then there's the Second Libyan Civil War, which, despite being the quarter of the two conflicts as it raged alongside the Syrian civil war has been even more of a geopolitical mess than Syria ever was. We've done a separate video on this channel detailing the wars in Libya, so do check that out if you'd like to learn more. But to put it as simply as we can, Libya's precious oil reserves have prompted most of the world's major military nations to pick a side. The conflict has seen Iran working for the same goals as the Americans. 
and the British. It's seen France split with the rest of the European Union and join Russia on the opposite side of the conflict, and it's seen Israel and Saudi Arabia work together for common goals even as Libya itself has splintered into a patchwork of militia-controlled territories. That's not to say that all sides have thrown in military support. Some, like the US, have stayed mostly focused on counterterrorism operations in the region. But even still, the battle for control of Libya has been entirely dependent on foreign funds and support, without which all parties would probably have collapsed a very long time ago. And much like Syria and Libya, Yemen's ongoing civil war has turned into a proxy conflict with a Saudi Arabian-led coalition, including support from the United Arab Emirates, Jordan, Egypt, America, the UK, and Germany, have battled an Islamist movement known as the Houthis, who, for the most part, fight their own battles on the ground, much like the North Vietnamese of the Vietnam War. However, they solicit ongoing support from an opposing coalition, spearheaded by Iran and backed up by Iraq, Syria, North Korea, and Russia. The Yemeni civil war is just one in a long series of proxy conflicts between Saudi Arabia and Iran who have fought a cold war of their own for some 45 years. They've shown up on the opposite sides of conflicts from Lebanon to Iraq to the Caucasus and the Balkans, and although China and Iraq have recently begun to help Iran and Saudi Arabia restore diplomatic relations, there's no long-term consensus yet on whether that peace will hold. And finally, there's the Russian invasion of Ukraine, where the question of whether or not the conflict truly qualifies as a proxy war has been a subject of heated debate in the last year and a half. Now, we certainly are going to try and settle that debate once and for all, but it does bear pointing out that the prior stage of the conflict, a low-grade war that was waged for years in Ukraine's Donbass region, was very much a proxy conflict. In those years, Russian-backed but Ukrainian-led separatist movements were responsible for fighting the Ukrainian state, not Russia directly. Since Russia invaded, of course, the conflict has been very clearly fought between Russia and Ukraine. And although Russia has claimed that large numbers of NATO troops are fighting in Ukraine, those claims are, to put it kindly, complete bullshit. The more relevant question is whether NATO's support for Ukraine, and on the other side China's evidently growing support for Russia, is enough to consider the war a true proxy conflict. There are legitimate arguments on both sides. On the one hand, Western financial and military support for Ukraine has absolutely bolstered the Ukrainian defense, so much so that it's an open question what the situation would look like today if that support had never come. But on the other hand, the war is very much a war of Ukrainian independence versus Russian annexation. And the two principal actors in that question, the two countries with the biggest stake in the answer, they're battling it out directly. Thus, even if both sides of the war receive backing from international partners, neither side would qualify as a proxy force acting out the will of a sponsor nation or coalition. Russian President Vladimir Putin has repeatedly invoked the idea of the Ukrainian invasion as a proxy war with the West, even a so-called defensive one. But this defense does little to excuse Russia's decision to invade a sovereign neighbor. As major and regional powers continue to grow more and more militarily fearsome, the question of proxy warfare has become increasingly pragmatic in recent years. Although it's still regarded as a low or even shameful form of warfare in some circles, other experts have advocated for a more focused development of proxy warfare doctrine from Western nations. Basically, the thinking goes that as the world's advanced militaries become more and more capable of doing massive damage to each other, proxy conflicts actually get more and more attractive as a less devastating alternative. Following from that, if nations are going to keep engaging in proxy warfare, then they should at least have guiding principles and doctrine prepared for when they do so. As our recent historical examples have made clear, the world certainly isn't at a loss for good proxy war tactics, but there's a lot of room between what we've currently got and a world in which powers like the US or the European Union develop proxy war skills as robust as, say, Iran. There's also potential for this to develop into yet another arms race, if you'll accept a fairly loose definition of the term, as China and the West both pivot toward proxy conflict in advance of a new Cold War that many experts believe has already begun. China has remained conspicuously absent from many of the proxy wars of the last half century or so, and has often chosen to play the role of peacemaker rather than a belligerent or sponsor. But this may well change as China continues its evolution into a more Cold War-esque hegemonic power. Whether or not China becomes the next major player in the proxy wars of the world, it seems entirely likely that the rest of the world's larger powers will continue to be drawn toward proxy warfare to suit their own goals. 
the United States and Russia have both proven continually willing to engage in this sort of conflict, and as Russia becomes more and more isolated on the world stage, perhaps even crossing into the territory of a pariah state like Iran or North Korea, it may begin to rely on proxy warfare even more to exert its power abroad. And speaking of Iran, both they and powerful Sunni states like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, as well as Israel, will probably be more than happy to continue their involvement in the proxy wars of the Middle East. No matter which way you slice it, proxy war has been an integral part of both the Cold War world order and the post-Soviet state of affairs that we find ourselves in today. Who exactly the belligerents and sponsors of future proxy wars will be, we'll have to wait and find out. But if one thing is certain, it's that proxy warfare itself will remain central in the years and the decades to come. If you haven't enjoyed the action yet, now's your chance. Click the link in the description or type playwt.link forward slash warographics in your browser and play War Thunder for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox. Remember, using my link gets you an awesome pack with premium vehicles, a premium account, boosters, and more. So what are you waiting for? Join War Thunder today, and thank you for watching.